Hello and good evening. My name is Kiro Gerstein and I'm very happy to welcome you to the final for this year uh, installment of uh, Kiro Gerstein Invites, an online forum hosted by Kronberg Academy. I am happy to be here coincidentally also uh, physically today at the Kronberg Academy, but they've been hosting us virtually the entire year and I think this is the 20th uh, seminar produced this year and I'm very thrilled to welcome all of you. Uh, your participation is what makes this seminar what it is and is essential and uh, it's also a coincidence that the last time that we uh, had Robert Levin as guest. Um, it was also in the same constellation. He was at home in uh, Boston and I was here at the Kronberg Academy. He spoke that time about Mozart concertos and played for us and improvised for us and uh, answered lots and lots of uh, questions. So I hope uh, you will participate today as well with all your questions. and. Uh, it's a joy that Robert could find the time and will speak about Bach. What better way to wrap up this year and prepare for the next year. So welcome, Robert. Welcome, everybody. And um, we just heard you play some Bach, certainly a piece that has some uh, long-term modulatory goals, as you described in your, uh, in your uh, teaser text. And um, I'm sure we'll hear much more about Bach and his uh, harmonic goals today. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kiro, for inviting me both times. And uh, a welcome to all of you who are uh, joining us from various points uh, in different places in the United States and North America and the world. Um, I love to talk about Bach as a tonal architect because his music is if not unique, it is extraordinary for the way that it melds intellectual potency uh, and the incandescence of, of Bach's uh, faith. And I'd like to uh, show a little bit about the way Bach invites us to take a tour of the musical tonal universe. And um, I'd like to start by just pointing out that there is an extraordinary sense of the power of logic that Bach invests in all of his music. You can see him like an expert chess player laying out the pieces and doing certain things in order to arrive in certain places. Um, uh, one of my favorite examples of this is a tiny little segment from the second of the four orchestral suites. This is the B minor, the one with flute and, and strings. And um, he moves from uh, B minor to D major, which is something that we would expect a piece in B minor to do, what we call uh, the relative major and what the Germans and certain other uh, people call the uh, parallel um, key, which we do not use as a terminology because, uh, well, uh, I don't want to get too much in into that. Um, we talk about parallel 
keys when D major is D minor or B major is B minor, and that's not what they do in Germany. So uh, Bach gets to D major, the piece begins, and so on with uh, the beginning of the Allegro section of the first overture movement, and he gets to, to uh, D major, and he gets to here. how beautifully he builds the arrival in that D major cadence by going to G major, the subdominant, then going to the dominant and the tonic, and triumphantly pulls in to his arrival point. And it's wonderful listening to the way Bach takes us on little side visits to places of this kind. Now, having said that, I'd like to uh, explain what I mean when I speak about uh, the tonal universe that Bach guides us through in his pieces. We have to first of all understand that this is not a phenomenon that is used by Bach in every single piece. In order for us to be taken on a tour of the universe, the piece has to be of a certain amplitude. So the larger pieces by Bach will display this feature that I'm going to talk about today, whereas uh, smaller preludes and other short keyboard pieces will not. Um, Bach always begins pieces in a state of definition so that we hear And having defined C major through a progression of rest, a little tension, more tension, and rest again, Bach defines the identity of the piece. And it's the same. And it's the same. And as soon as he announces and defines the key in that brief progression, he then feels able and empowered to walk out of the garden gate and venture into the world itself in the larger sense. So uh, when he is writing a piece, as I say, of a certain structural size, then he makes it very, very clear that he has this universe, this constellation, this group of planets, if you like, that he has in mind. And I'd like to show this both in major and in minor. So starting with, with major, I'm going to uh, call our attention to the second Brandenburg Concerto, the first movement thereof, which of course is not a piece which is designed for the keyboard, and so it's going to be a little bit awkward. I'll do my best to render the orchestral texture more or less comprehensibly um, at the piano, and I'm going to comment as I move through the piece to see what is going on. We understand that a piece that is in F major will inevitably wish to go to the dominant, to the fifth degree of the scale, and therefore, uh, just as the C major prelude goes to the dominant key of G before coming back, to C major and then pulling into the long prolonged dominant. So that's a, a simpler version of a, a guided tour going from one to five and then back from tonic to dominant and then back. So let's take a look at what happens in the second Brandenburg concerto where he has more time. He's got over a hundred bars and you'll see that he goes to various places and it will behoove us to try to understand why he chooses those places and not others. So listen as carefully as you wish and ask yourself as I describe the trajectory that Bach is embarking on here and see if you can 
imagine and understand what Bach is doing and why he might be doing it. So we start and clearly therefore gives us a joyous definition of um, of the F major tonality. Uh, let's get that out. Um, and as soon as he does that, he gives a corroboration of that F major. He goes to C major, to the dominant, which was what we would expect. And that repeats that. And so now we started in an F major and we've gone to C major. In a typical piece by Haydn or Mozart or Beethoven, they would go from C major to G major, or in this case from F major to C major. There'd be a double bar, the sonata exposition would be repeated, there'd be some adventure in the development, we come home. So that essentially the goal is to go from one to five and then home. But Bach has a slightly more ambitious a more far-flung idea. So once we get to here, he goes back with the trumpet uh, to F major and then to D minor. D minor, which we would call the relative minor, it is the key which shares the same key signature with the tonic key of F major. So Bach has now gone from F major to C major and from C major to D minor. That's more or less axiomatic, but he's not done. down what we call the circle of fifths he goes he goes D G C F now he seems to be home we can't quite believe that this movement is going to be over so soon but it isn't to B flat. All right, so let's trace the, the trajectory. We've gone from F major, which is one, to C major, which is five, from there to D minor, which is six, and now to B flat major, which is four. to C minor, but whereas all of the places that he's visited up till now always have a very, very clear cadence. Or, or, and every one of them wraps up with a very, very clearly articulated and powerful, perfect cadence in the key. In this case,
He is briefly in C minor, but he does not give us that firm key. So there's something about the C minor which is not as prioritary as all of the other places. And now we're in G minor. the second degree of the scale. So now we have gone from here to here to here to here to there. All right? We go from there. In F major, the third degree of the scale. And he turns the corner and says, now I'm going home. to home and we're back in F major. So let us now summarize the prioritary places that Bach has visited. He's gone from here to here to here, from there to here, from there to here, and there to here. So in other words, if we construct on all of the degrees of the scale, we construct triads, three note chords, using the vocabulary of the scale, but not this because you get a diminished chord, which is a dissonance, and you, you can go here. But you cannot go because it doesn't have the stability necessary to establish a tonal center. So if you take F major, the first degree of the scale, which is the tonic, you have five places that are possible to visit. In other words, minor, minor, major, major, and minor. Those five places. Theorists call those the related keys because they are diatonic in the tonic key, which means that you don't need any accidentals. So you have D minor because, but not D major, because D major would require an F sharp, which is not found in the F major scale. I hope this isn't too abstruse for all of you. Um, so Bach has se selected here five keys to visit, all of which are found within the scale of the tonality that he has chosen. He's chosen to write a piece in F major, so therefore his possible goals are G minor, A minor, B flat major, C major, and D minor. Now I want to point out that Bach uses the same principle when he writes keys and uh, pieces in minor. So to give you an example of that, I am going to turn to the toccata that begins the sixth of Bach's six keyboard partitas. 
That begins, as you'll recall, with this extraordinarily powerful uh, uh, salvo in a key, E minor, which is the key of lamentation. It is um, the key of mourning. That is the reason why, for instance, Bach in the St. Matthew Passion and so on, this extraordinary moment uh, is set to the text, Kommt ihr Töchter, hilf mir klagen, come my daughters, help me to mourn. So E minor is that key, and by the way, uh, the German word for that is Trauer, and Haydn, who writes an E minor symphony, calls it his Trauer Sinfonie, and Mozart, when writing his E minor violin sonata, uh, which in which he thinks about the death of his mother, once again chooses E minor. So there is a whole uh, register of affects, of emotions, which are associated with individual keys. F major, the key of the second Brandenburg, is the pastoral key. And you see... Likewise, Beethoven in his pastoral symphony chooses F major. So uh, in this uh, extraordinary piece of lament, uh, the uh, Toccata from the E minor uh, partita, uh, it begins, as I say, with this quite spectacular... <laughs> And then its middle portion um, is a fugue, and it is the structure, the tonal structure of that fugue that I want us to examine here. Again, um, this is minor rather than major, so it'll be interesting to see what box choices are going to be. He starts in E minor. <laughs> he goes from E minor to B minor. Um, this is not yet of structural importance. It is what he does when he writes a fugue. All composers, when they write fugues, they have the subject in the tonic and the answer in the dominant. So there's a, a kind of alternation between one and five, in this case, E minor and B minor. Um, but that is not yet a tonal journey. That's just the same axiom as it is to go... To go one, <clears throat> one, two, five, one, and explain what the basic tonality of the piece is. So we have again. Else. Now, now, pardon my, my, <clears throat> my throat here. In this case, he's gone beyond the regular alternation between B minor uh, and E minor, 5 and 1, and he actually moves us from E minor to B minor. So this is a tonal goal. <laughs> which point he moves back to the tonic. Thank you. 
So he's gone to G major, he's gone to B minor. So all right, we've started in E minor, <clears throat> he's gone to B, and now he's gone to G. Let's see what happens after that. So keeping track now, we went from E to B, yeah, and then to G, and now to D. Let's see what happens after that. Let's keep track again from E to B to G to D to A. All right, then what happens? C major. All right. You see how the gaps are being filled in. And at this point, he has reached the total universe that he needs to give to us. And everything else that happens from this point on will simply reiterate goals that he's already established. So. Departed. which is, of course, something in Bach's entire oeuvre, which is unique. He does not go back to E minor at the end. He goes to B minor first. does he come back to E minor and end the piece. So, once again, we look at the vocabulary that's available to Bach in these related keys. And so we start with E. We have to skip the second degree because because it's dissonant and is not therefore usable. The third degree, G, A, B, C, and D. So we have from here five related keys, just as in F major, we had five related keys. So you see, it does not really matter whether Bach is writing a piece in major or whether he's writing a piece in minor. In both cases, in addition to the tonic triad, which defines the identity of the piece, it gives it its flavor and its character, 
there are always five keys that are available to Bach to give him an architecture which is not based on a triangle in which the dominant is at the top and the tonic is at the bottom, but a pentagon. It has five areas of, uh, of tonal goals and tonal architectures. So at this point, it's necessary and useful to ask a basic question. What is Bach doing here and why is he doing it? Now, Bach, of course, when he writes music, is doing a number of things at once. He is writing creatively pieces that he and other people will perform. He is teaching his pupils to become superb instrumentalists through the training that he gives them. The same thing is true for the vocalists in his choral and vocal works. So there is that. He is also at the same time teaching them how to compose music because he's showing them how musical architecture works. And to be sure, there is always a spiritual element. But the real question, as I say, is why does Bach choose in his far-flung pieces to go to five keys? to all five of the related keys, to all five of the keys whose vocabulary, whose sounds are based upon the scale of the piece that he's writing in. So in F major, as we saw, or in E minor, as we saw, Now, it might be tempting to say that the reason that Bach does this, that he goes to these keys based on these chords in these tonalities, the reason he does so is because it's there. That is actually the tonal building block, the set of blocks, and therefore Bach living in the age of enlightenment, when people are telling other people things, explaining things to people, trying to characterize and educate, that given the fact that it is possible to construct major and minor chords on the various degrees of the scale, Bach, seeing that that is possible, does so. He does so to show you, in fact, that given this tonal universe, that Bach takes you on a guided tour of that universe because it's there. And he, seeing this, wishes <clears throat> to explain it, to make it into the basis for the music that he writes. So in other words, the universe is there, Bach sees it, Bach understands it, and therefore he turns it into the substance of his pieces. Now I ask you, this seems relatively convincing, doesn't it? I mean, given the fact of how 18th century thinkers were working, that Bach, seeing these things, perceiving these things, creates his music in order to point out that this is what he encounters, this is what he understands, and therefore he wishes to give it to us. I, when I first pondered this question, felt that that was a satisfactory answer. But it took me a little while to come to the conclusion that it was not a bad answer, but it was not a complete answer. And that there was something that was more profound than the mere existence of this tonal universe that caused Bach to do what he did. 
And to try to guess what that might be, one needs only to ask oneself a very important question. There's Bach discovering the universe, celebrating it, explaining it, using it as basis for his music, yes. But if he is writing this music based on the awareness, the discovery of the universe, you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, who made the universe? From Bach's point of view, who made the universe? And then one is forced to say, oh, the same Bach that writes J, J at the top of his manuscripts, Jesus, Yuva, Jesus, help, or who writes J, N, J, in nomine Jesu, in Jesus' name, or who writes at the bottom of the manuscript at the end, SDG, soli deo gloria, glory only to God. Now, my friends, my listeners, please, I don't wish to make anybody uncomfortable in raising this issue. And it is not my business who among you are religious or are not religious, are skeptics or are uh, persuaded by these sorts of things. But there can be no question whatsoever in contemplating Bach, the centrality of his faith. And therefore, I think the likelihood of this cosmological approach to writing pieces is that Bach writes this music which explains, exploits, and explores the universe because for him, in so doing, he is celebrating the glory of God. So I put all of this out to you to consider in the hope that some of you may find it convincing. And for those of you who don't uh, or who have some other ideas about all of this, that we can now provoke a dialogue, a chat about uh, all of this. Needless to say, in choosing these two examples, the F major second Brandenburg concerto and the E minor a Toccata from the Sixth Partita, these are not isolated examples of this phenomenon. Virtually any piece by Bach which has a certain kind of, as I said, amplitude, a certain shape, a certain kind of ambition, is going to display this five-tiered exploration of the keys which are based on the scales of the tonalities that he has chosen for those particular pieces. So there is my little theorem. And uh, I hope there are people who wish to speak, ask, judge. I open up the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, brilliant, brilliant as, as always. And yes, uh, very much um, your your questions now. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and comments now are um, are most uh, welcome. Uh, I see we have uh, Stuart Isakov here who has written an excellent oh, super. Book about the about the, um, the uh, development of our uh, our tonal system, so to say. Um, but uh, one question, so not a very profound one. You're saying that this rather complete exploration of the tonalities uh, by Bach in this way um, is linked to a certain scope of the pieces. You wouldn't say that you observe it more in, um, let's say, non non fugal or uh, or fugal uh, settings or certain orchestration instrumentation. For you say that you observe it in. Um, in, in pieces of certain scope? It's, it's a matter of dimension. It's not a matter of, uh, for instance, the, the particular musical form, which is a reason, and I should have said this, it's a reason why I chose the two pieces that I did. 
Um, the second Brandenburg Concerto is, of course, uh, a piece based on the, the concerto principle that Bach uh, inherited from Antonio Vivaldi. And uh, it is an episodic construction. Um, fugues, I wanted to have represented, and therefore I chose the center section of the Toccata, which is indeed a fugue. And we see that in both cases, Bach is able to uh, define the architecture of these two pieces, which use very, very different uh, formal considerations, um, and nonetheless explores the five related keys which are found there. Now, this does not mean, please, that there aren't pieces by Bach which go to more exotic places. You know, in Cantata 101, Nimm von uns, Herr du Teuer Gott, he arrives from A minor to E minor. I mean, you know, some of you are going to say, no, no, it's absolutely inconceivable that Bach wrote something like that. It sounds like Mahler. Well, maybe it does sound like Mahler, but it is in Cantata 101. If you look it up, you'll see that it's the case. So there is a case where Bach goes to an unimaginably distant key from E minor uh, to C minor. So it's not inconceivable that Bach will do something like this, but as a general structural principle, he tends to advocate these uh, uh, related keys. Uh, we have several comments and uh, questions already. Uh, one is from, uh, this one is, uh, <laughs> gets us into something very deep. Irmgard uh, Scheitler says, very convincing, but the sophisticated way how Bach reaches his goals, you did not explain. And this, I think, is very, very interesting. Well, <laughs> so, this is quite a, um, a challenge to explain exactly how uh, Bach reaches his goals. Uh, but do you care to comment? <laughs> It's, it, it's a, an excellent question, and it deserves to be asked, and I'm so glad that it was. Um, what's interesting, you see, about choosing related keys is that because the three tones that create the triad, the, the chord of each of these keys, because every single one of them is found within the scale of the principal tonality, as I've said, F major... Because every single one of those chords is found within F major, you do not have to construct very exotic modulations, motion from one key to another, because everything fits very, very well and tightly together. What is interesting, however, if you want to look very, very carefully, uh, one of the things that Bach uses, and having gotten this from Vivaldi, is sequences. The sequence is a particular module which is repeated success, successively either higher or lower. One of the standard examples of such a sequence is the so-called circle of fifths in which we take, say, F major and create a downward cycle. And therefore, we get all of the notes of the scale, but they're arranged in descending fifth. Notice that one of them has the dissonance, the, the so-called devil in music, as it was called in, in earlier times, the diabolos in musica, because on the page it looks perfectly like all of its brethren, uh, but it turns out to have a dissonance in it. And so we heard in the uh, fifth Brandenburg concerto... <laughs> that that descending fifth uh, uh, sequence and there are other sequences of the similar kind that Bach uses for instance going down so what we hear is here a sequence that goes each time down a third. 
So sequences are a very, very good way of getting from one place to another. It's like going into a department store, going to the KDV and going from the lady sportswear into the toy department. Uh, and they help take you from one place to another. Um, of course, uh, Vivaldi was extraordinarily fond of, of these sorts of sequences, and he was by no means alone. Certainly Corelli was too, and Handel, who derived his Concetti Grossi from those of Corelli, also this kind of um, sequential way of getting from one place to another. I hope that uh, that to some extent provides an answer. And um, And since you mention other composers, um, can you talk more about how you single out Bach for, for this strategic uh, exploration of God-created universe? This is not something you would say we observe similarly in just mentioned uh, Handel or, or, or Vivaldi or Froberger. Well, what's, or... Yes, what's interesting about it is, of course, obviously, different composers are going to have some uh, intellectual and, and uh, tonal curiosity and they will wish to go to places other than uh, just the, the tonic key. Because, of course, if you have a piece which consists of only one key the whole time, it's going to get rather tedious. Um, but uh, there are very few composers who have the intellectual rigor uh, that, that Bach does in which he makes it his point to explore everything. Other composers might do it once or twice, but Bach does it systematically in all of his large scale pieces. And therefore we can speak of it as being an intention of Bach, something which lies at the core of his philosophy of composition in a way that it does not in, in a similar degree uh, for other composers. Um, obviously there are going to always be exceptions that prove rules. And of course, sequences are found not just in Baroque music, they're certainly found uh, in, in music of the classic period and the romantic period and so on. So uh, they are not unique uh, to the Baroque era, uh, but uh, the Baroque era uses sequences systematically far more uh, pervasively. And uh, Bach is a person whose richness of harmonic vocabulary and again, his, his uh, extraordinary intellectual powers can line up sequences one after another, uh, allowing for variety and never seeming boring. If you think, for instance, about the concerto for three keyboards in C major, where you get count how many sequences that was lined up in, in, in one after the other, and not one of them is identical to the others. You have this. And, 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 and. One is confronted with a sense of inexhaustible Bach, that he will never run out of ideas. I mean, in the way that Mozart, for instance, is a master of a huge variety of melodies in, in a piece. Uh, and uh, so that's something that, that could be the topic of some other conversation. But perhaps this, again, I, I think uh, can, can give you a, a sense of how Bach synthesizes uh, a constructive possibility, these, these sequences on the one hand, and then uses this universe of available chords that exist within any particular tonality. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, British philosopher uh, Christoph Peacock uh, asks, so why did Bach stop at the five related keys and not include more distant ones? I presume meaning in this sort of larger structural plan. Well, uh, it is not a question of what Bach does and, and, and doesn't do, because he does both of those things. Bach does go to extraordinary 
uh, remote tonal places, um, but his normative procedure, the glorification of tonality, comes by living within a world in which the vocabulary is a reflection of and a confirmation of the, the tonality that he has chosen. Uh, when he wishes to do something which is shattering, yes, he will go to extraordinary lengths and to remote places, uh, which many composers will do. Of course, the 19th century, the Romantic era, is full of, of uh, exotic modulations. And even, uh, you know, a composer like Mozart in the C minor piano concerto, where you uh, uh, are starting... Which becomes and we are in F sharp major in a key in C minor the idea that you're gonna I mean it's it's absolutely unimaginable I see something here, yes, from Christopher Dexter Mills to all panels, yes. Neapolitans, yeah. of, of, of course. <clears throat> you will, the Neapolitan sixth is a very interesting kind of business, as is the augmented sixth chord, you know, so you have. Bach seems to have had an aversion to augmented sixth chords. <clears throat> but he certainly uses Neapolitans. It's an alteration of the second degree of the scale. So it, it is there as a coloration, and actually, interestingly enough, one of the very few places where you'll find Bach using an augmented sixth chord is in his Cantata Non Sacchi Sia Dolore, written in fairly execrable Italian, a cantata 209, where he hears, and it's about a friend from Ansbach who is going to Italy, and so it may very well be that the idea of the augmented sixth chord seemed to Bach to have a certain Italian origin, and so he adjusts his harmonic vocabulary uh, to do something like that. Um, but I, I would like to make clear, if I haven't already done so sufficiently already, that uh, None of the things that I've talked about are exclusive. That is, I'm not suggesting that Bach uses the related keys to the exclusion of everything else. That's most definitely not the case. But the normative procedure of how he defines tonality is very much taken up uh, with the, uh, the universe that I've uh, tried to uh, demonstrate with these uh, examples that I've uh, played for you. Yes, I think that's a, that's an important clarification. Um, though there's a quite a flow of uh, interesting questions about the non-normative. For example, uh, Stuart Isaacov asked uh, just a few minutes earlier, "says Bravo, can you say something about the most exotic or strange examples of Bach's harmonic wanderings, such as the twenty-fifth variation of the Goldberg variations?" It's absolutely shattering, this, this music. And it's interesting that you should mention the Goldberg variations because by this time, Bach is beginning to uh, reckon with this, the, the new generation. You know, he's reckoning with what his son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, uh, is doing, which is really also quite audacious. And Bach seems to be writing in a more Galon style and in a more uh, coloristic style than he did earlier, uh, but there are so many places, if you think of the Art of Fugue, which has a second subject, in which you have...
I mean, they hear that. Is, is really something that can keep you up at night. So, there, and of course, the Art of Fugue is one of Bach's very, very last compositions. So he continues to speculate about these things, no, no question uh, uh, about it. And, um, you know, I, I, I think just pulling things out of the air, the Cantata Helge nicht ins Gericht, Cantata 105, where you have... Suddenly he goes. So no, no question. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not the only person who says that anything that ever could be done in the domain of music, looking into the future from the 18th century, there is nothing that you cannot find anticipated somewhere in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. His searching uh, for things, his daring, his speculative nature uh, leads him to voyages of discovery, which are absolutely extraordinary. But those extraordinary voyages, as fascinating as they may be to us, they build upon a bedrock of axioms. And it is those axioms which have formed the basis of the talk that I've given today. In other words, we need to understand how his basic modus operandi uh, it, it works before we can then start to uh, ponder some of the more exotic and more uh, uh, unusual kinds of explorations upon which he does indeed embark. Uh, very fascinating. And uh, in his own trajectory, uh, in Bach's own trajectory, can you f point to a certain period or uh, approximate uh, time when when this when this strategy emerges? Or do you find this is really from the very early uh, larger scope pieces? I think, you know, look, he, he is in Weimar, you know, uh, with Johann Ernst von Sachsen Weimar, and uh, who was a, a, um, an in a musical enthusiast. And he would send a lackey to Amsterdam, which was the center of the dissemination of music at that time, early in the 18th century. And uh, the lackey came back from Amsterdam with the keyboard suites of uh, Francois Dupin and with the concertos of Antonio Vivaldi. And it is clear that these provoked a veritable explosion in Bach's creative energy. He suddenly saw things that were going on in this music uh, that opened up perspectives to him that he had not hitherto imagined. So uh, when you look at, for instance, you played the the A minor second English suite. The... And if you look at that, there are already uh, a fair number of these keys that are, are visited there because we have we get C major. We get E minor. We get C major. Get G major. So you see, uh, already in that early period, Bach is, is, is beginning to explore uh, the options that he has and uh, to use them in large scale uh, pieces. The same thing in the G minor uh, English suite, whose uh, prelude very much based on, on Vivaldi, also goes to. A variety of related keys. So uh, Bach is in every respect systematic. This is the way he works and um, the pedagogical aspect of what he's doing 
explaining things, showing things is, is terribly important. There's also the fact that Bach is an inveterate tinkerer. When you look at the manuscripts to his pieces, you can see that every time he teaches a piece again, whether it's a prelude and fugue from the well-tempered clavier um, or, or one of his keyboard concertos, every time he uh, is working on that with a pupil, he is doing decorations, uh, variations, alternatives, which in fact, you would never want to put all together into one composite because uh, there would be simply too many uh, decorations and it would be a little bit like uh, pouring a liter of chocolate sauce over a tiny little ball of vanilla ice cream. Uh, we may like chocolate sauce, but it's a bit too much. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and uh, there was a question earlier, a uh, very relevant one from Marshall Marcus, uh, saying, could you comment on Bach's uh, tonal structure across the really large scale pieces, uh, for example, the passions, and talk about whether you observe this idea at a larger meta level or if something else is then at play. Hi, Marshall. <laughs> nice to have you on board. Um, it's a different sort of situation. If, if we go into the future, well, wait a minute, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, there is a quite provocative book uh, called uh, Bach's Cycle, Mozart's Arrow, uh, written by Carol Berger, in which he speaks of Bach's writing in a secular sort of way uh, and uh, Mozart going from one place to uh, another. Um, I wrote a rather long uh, review of that for the Journal of the American Musicological Society some years ago. and. It seems to me uh, Bach does not have feel the necessity of coming home in large scale pieces as a general rule. It's not that there aren't certain cases. For instance, the Christmas Oratorio, which consists of six cantatas, which actually aren't mentioned meant to be performed at a single sitting. The first cantata is in D major. The second one is in G major. The third one is in D major. The fourth one is in F major. The fifth one is in A major. And the sixth one is in D major. So three of the six are in D major, but not intended to be performed together. If you look at the St. John Passion, it opens in G minor and it ends in E flat major. In the St. Matthew Passion, it begins in E minor and ends in C minor. The only composer that I know who consistently in large scale pieces wished to have the piece end in the same key that it began. And now I'm talking about operas. That composer is Mozart. Seraglio begins and ends in C major. Huh? So, uh, so does Così fan tutte. Uh, the Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni begin in D and end in D. The Magic Flute begins in E flat and ends in E flat. Yes, it's true, for instance, that uh, Die Meisterzinger of, of uh, Wagner begins and ends in C major, but there are plenty of operas by Wagner that don't do that, so it's not a central part of the way he thinks. Uh, I suspect that Mozart was thinking about the Aristotelian uh, uh, doctrines of unity of time, place, and action, and thinking at a certain point, what for a musician would be the, the kind of uh, uh, how shall I say, um, the equivalent of unity of time, place, and action. And that would be unity of, to of tonality. But again, as I say, uh, he's one of the very rare people who does that, and, and Bach sometimes does in the cantatas, which are, of course last maybe 20 to 25 minutes, most of them, some of them are a bit longer. They often end in the same key that they begin, but not necessarily. So it's an option, uh, but not uh, a, uh, an absolute requirement from his point of view. Yes, of course, I could sit down here and name uh, three dozen Bach cantatas that end in the same key that they begin, but I could also mention plenty of them that don't. I mean, it goes without saying that if you have a, a, um, a suite or a partita or something like that, of course, it's going to stay in the same key. That's a normative thing because it's a sequence of dances. 
Uh, there are uh, a couple of questions that I think are in the in a similar direction. You just uh, mentioned Mozart and possibly following the Aristotelian beliefs. Seth Lachterman earlier asked, could Bach be espousing uh, the generally accepted Kepler belief that the six known planets at the time were separated by the five platonic solids? So it's believed for centuries and six planets are separated by orbit dimension scale to these solids. And in somewhat similar um, vein, Renata Schöpflin says, I wonder, since Bach is usually not doing anything without a reason, do those related key chords maybe have any specific meanings besides, well, let's use every chord of the universe, similar to your idea of his use of the augmented six chord, would there be any hint for that, whether tonic stands for Godfather and dominant for Godson or whatever? She says, I'm just speculating. But I think we see, we see the general direction of the questions. It, it is a speculation well worth uh, indulging in, I would say. Um, you know, uh, symbology in Bach is extraordinarily uh, important. Uh, if you think about the third uh, part of the Klavierübung, the so-called German organ mass, um, which uh, has, and this is a good example of, of the global point, um, it opens with a grand uh, prelude for uh, organ in E-flat and ends with a fugue in E-flat. <laughs> has a triple fugue, and the triple fugue is not coincidental. The piece is in three flats. Why? Because of the Trinity. Why do you have three subjects? Well, because you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And so those things are clearly intentional. And in many of the Bach cantatas in particular, there are are these issues of symbology. And we also have to understand that, that Bach was also fascinated by numerology. The fact that if one, if A is one and B is two and so on and so forth, that Bach adds up to 14. And as in Latin, I and J are the same, J.S. Bach adds up to 41. So the fact that one was 14 and the other was 41, obviously fascinated Bach and he uh, actually writes pieces that use 14 and, and 41. I'll give you an example. Having just played the E minor partita toccata uh, a little while back, uh, you will notice when you look at the uh, six partitas, every one of them has seven movements except for the second one. And of course, you might say, well, I mean, if Bach only felt like writing six movements for the second partita, that's his good right. What is the significance of that? It can't be very important. Well, if you have five partitas which have seven movements, that's 35. And if you have one which has six, then the total is 41. And I don't think that's coincidental. You see, that's that's the whole point. So Bach is fascinated by these numerological things, and they characterize a lot of his music. Uh, thank you. In fact, there was a question that so came almost parallel as your as uh, as your answer now from uh, Gorka Plada, I believe, a young pianist. Do you have any findings or theorems related to numerology or play with numbers in these key relations you talk about? We know of the spelling of his family name and their equivalent numbers of the alphabet in Kunst der Fugge, but he's wondering if you have any other findings to share. Well, of course, Bach, the use of BACH is not limited by any means to Die Kunst der Fuga. I mean, it's found, for instance, uh, in two of the canonic variations uh, based on the Christmas song from Himmel hoch, da kam ich her, uh, which Bach wrote as uh, the entrance exam to a contrapuntal society in Leipzig in, I believe, 1747. Uh, uh, there are other uh, uh, examples, too. And uh, I, I don't think you'd have to look terribly hard to, uh, to find them. I mean, uh, because of course uh, B is in German is B flat and H is uh, B natural, which is something which comes from uh, a, a long time uh, before. And um, of course, there is also the issue of the hexachord. So you have Utre Mi Fa Sola, in which you have the natural hexachord, C, D, E, F, G, A, and you have the soft hexachord with the B flat and the hard hexachord with B natural. And of course the soft and the hard have to do with B moll and B dua in German that's used for minor and, and major. 
because it comes from the uh, the soft B and the hard B, which is why the flat is rounded and the natural is uh, at right angles. All of these things have long origins that go back centuries. It's fascinating. Um, a great question from uh, John Dethridge, who says, hi, Robert. And, and John, hi, hi. John was, was, was uh, here in the previous year and gave a fantastic uh, discussion and lecture about uh, Wagner and Schubert and many, many things in between. So John asks, do you think Bach really belongs to the Enlightenment? If his systematic demonstration of tonal relations does have a God created the universe implication. How does this square with Rousseau's complaint against Rameau that this has little to do with down to earth experiences of actual human beings, a longing for happiness that's surely a key point of enlightenment thinking? <laughs> well, we could have a conversation on that subject for at least three hours. <laughs> the The fact of the of the matter is that, of course, both Rameau and, and Bach uh, were systematic espousers of uh, the science uh, of music. Um, but I would have to say that just because um, uh, they are codifying principles certainly doesn't mean that the results of their findings uh, do not address matters of intuition um, and instinct in listeners. Uh, that's why I say it would be a very long and and uh, and complex sort of of discussion. Uh, but when you examine uh, 18th century uh, music, uh, one discovers uh, all sorts of things that sometimes don't necessarily strike the listener immediately, but uh, with time uh, turn out to be absolutely central. I mean, how many of us as per performers and as, uh, for that matter, as composers are, are looking at a piece of music and having heard it a hundred times or having played it dozens of times, we suddenly realize, oh my God, I never noticed that. And then you think, oh my heavens, if I played this piece as I did five years ago before I realized this, is somebody sitting in the seventh row in seat H17, will they have figured out that I didn't realize it? That would be horrible, you know? I mean, the, the, the question I remember, for just to, to cite a very simple example, the, uh, the Brahms F minor clarinet, or if you wish, viola sonata that... Uh, Uh, I mean, Bach, you know, I, I'm fond of saying that, that there are, uh, since we're talking about philosophical things here, there is the whole issue of free will versus predestination. In fact, I've given lectures on predestination versus free will in classical music. Uh, and uh, I'm fond of saying that if you are a person that believes in free will, then stay away from the music of Beethoven and Brahms because you're not going to like what you find there because their music does not really admit very much uh, free will. Things are always uh, uh, pretty much predestined. And so you have... So this idea... And so on, and later, later on... You know, and I have to admit, I played that a long time before I noticed that one of them was, was uh, uh, twice as slow as the other, but it was the same musical idea, and I felt very ashamed of myself. So, uh, you know, looking, looking at Rameau, looking at, at, at Bach, I mean, I cannot imagine that these people did not plumb the, the, the most profound depths of uh, musical coherence. Um, how, to what extent any individual listener would pick up on that, that's, of course, hard to speculate. But I, I think uh, that certainly a composer who was such a, a great dramatist as Rameau was, as, as Bach was, understood very, very clearly the, re the relationship between 
um, the choice of tones, the choice of rhythms, the, the, all of the, the musical elements that go into a superior composition without being uh, thoughtful and careful about the, the choices that they made. Uh, but as I say, it's a, it's a huge subject. Absolutely, and thank you, thank you, John, for the question. Thank you, thank you, Great Robert, question. for all the uh, all the answers. And um, and now wading into ever ever a broader uh, uh, forest, uh, you just mentioned. So, how does this come across? Or does this come across to the to the listener? And what happens with our realizations that, oh, for years, I didn't realize that this note was connected to a note 17, 79 measures later. Um, how, well, how do you think this, this does work? Is this a, in your, in your mind, do you find that this is a inner game for the composer to sort of make strategies to write music? Or do you find that listeners um, get this on a non-verbal level and also what interests me so absolutely fascinating and absolutely important to know these things um, we have a lot of performers uh, practical people as our participants also and one could say as a student well so what happens uh, in my playing? You know, how do I play this differently? Do I play it differently? So I want to wade a little bit in the direction of, well, I guess, uh, music psychology and cognition in some way, and how it relates to what you've just spoken about. Yeah, this is very, very important. And, you know, for many years, I taught music theory, and I've written theory textbooks, and so on. And I always emphasize to my students that for every valid performance, there should be a valid analysis and vice versa, right? that, that you can invoke things. If you're rehearsing a piece of chamber music with three other people and one of them says, I think we should go faster here, and the other person says, I think we should go slower, how are you going to make that decision? If you can point to a detail in the piece that justifies your attitude, then you can use your powers of persuasion and people will say, oh, I hadn't noticed that. That's very good. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try your way. Well, why not? Um, Whereas if the person just says, well, that's the way I want it, and you say, well, that's not the way I want it, then you're just going to end up, you know, punching each other in the face or uh, just simply intimidating people in, in a way that's not uh, particularly fruitful uh, musically. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I remember taking an analysis course at Harvard with, with the composer Leon Kirchner, and he was talking about something which came up here and there, and I said, but Professor Kirchner, how do you know how can you know whether the composer did that on purpose or whether it was not just simply intuitive? And he looked at me, he said, Bob, I can't tell you what Beethoven thought. I can only tell you what I see and what I hear. And, you know, it, it's, you can say, well, isn't it possible to know these things? Well, sometimes it is. You look at Beethoven's sketches and you see what he's doing and you realize that he, he takes an idea in a particular direction and you realize that that has to be intentional because you see it actually happening, the chronology of invention. But I, I think it's, it's useful for us to understand that there will always be artists who have an extraordinarily powerful sense of intuition. And those people may not need to study music theory because somehow without ever having studied it, they somehow sense these things. But for the rest of us mere mortals, I think it behooves us to study the music deeply and conscientiously to try to understand what we can about how a particular idea then has consequences. And in a composer like Bach, as I say, the, the power of the intellect is so overwhelming at almost every point in the piece that there, there can be very few questions about this. Um, in, a, in a piece by, by Brahms or Beethoven, the same thing is true, and they're by no means uh, uh, limited to them. I mean, if you look at the, the, the first Kammersymphony of Schoenberg, you'll see the same kind of thing going on. And uh, I enjoy uh, discovering cases where it does seem that the composer is thinking about these things. Um, if you think, for instance, about the Mozart C major viola quintet, and, and it starts... <laughs> And you hear this. 
that quite extraordinary sound with the C sharp there. You say, well, C sharp, well, Mozart wants to write a C sharp, let him write a C sharp, you know? There's no big deal about that. But then... There it is again. A C sharp mas masquerading as a C sharp. Are you getting a little bit uneasy? I'm getting a little bit uneasy about all of these C sharps. I think at that point we can definitively rule out coincidence. You see, it, it's too causal. The, the idea here in so much music is that a, a little note shows up in the margin of a particular musical idea, and we think, oh, that was nothing. And then it shows up again, and then again, and after a while, the, the sheer centrality of something that seemed absolutely frivolous turns out to be earth-shattering. And that's, that's, of course, one way to write musical compositions. It's not the only one. I mean, I don't think Francis Poulenc spent a great deal of time trying to do those things, he was a much more intuitive composer, but he still was, was perhaps the greatest composer of songs of the 20th century. Uh, but you would say in the case of, for example, Bach, and, and I agree with you, and I think many of us agree that uh, when one looks at the construction of these uh, pieces, eventually one is absolutely overwhelmed by what seems to as a superhuman uh, intellectual ability. But you would say that, for example, going back to your uh, opening uh, thesis that that Bach thought about this also on the verbal level, that this is not a um, sort of uh, uh, an instinctive construction that had a pupil come uh, and asked him about this, that this was something that, that he had thought about um, in, a, in well, a way you can communicate in words. Well, you see, uh, the evidence of of Bach's systematic approach to uh, art is simply too overwhelming. I mean, look at the well-tempered Clavier, for heaven's sake. I mean, nobody else up to that time had written, there are people who had written, I mean, the Ariadne Musica of Johann Kaspar Ferdinand Fischer, for instance, but it doesn't use all of the keys. Bach uses all of them, yeah? He writes the 15, uh, two and three part inventions using the, the most usable keys, 15 out of the 24. You see, there are all of these pieces of his and collections of pieces of his, which are without any possible question, a matter of his systematic approach to things. Even those things that he never finished, like the Orgelbüchlein, which was going to be uh, synoptic in terms of its presentation of, of all of the chorales through the church years and the church cycles that he wrote of cantatas in Leipzig. You see, there, there's too much evidence here uh, of, of Bach's looking at things in a global sort of way. That's why it seems to me that the word cosmology is not entirely out of place when, when referring uh, to his approach to musical composition, that he sees these things in a large sense. Um, you've mentioned well-tempered clavier. You've men we've been circling one of these themes, and already several people have asked questions about uh, tuning and temperament. Ian West earlier asked, "Do you think Bach changed the temperament that he used during his his life, such as Werkmeister or Equal?" And then there was a question a little. Uh, later from Thomas Gommel, Mr. Levin, you spoke about the different characters of different keys. I can understand that in between the development of a piece, but on a piano which is tuned in equal temperament, for me, F major is similar to E major. I guess that you know about Bradley Lehman paper. There is a design of Bach with loops which shows that Bach didn't tune his instrument in equal intonation. Does this make sense? Question mark. So, and we still have Stuart Isakov here with us. Uh, so, um, I guess it's time to speak a little bit about temperament and and, and what do you think uh, Bach's relationship to it? First of all, 
Uh, let's start by saying that there is no evidence whatsoever that I have encountered anywhere uh, that Bach uh, had equal temperament in mind in writing Das Wohltemperier der Klavier. Um, in fact, uh, let's step back a bit and, and say that in, in mentioning Klavier, um, he is talking about keyboard instruments. It used to be when I was growing up, the, the title given to it was the well-tempered clavichord. Because in late 18th century parlance, clavier meant clavichord. But in fact, what Bach is, is writing is something called the well-tempered keyboard and is basically saying that if you devise a suitable tuning system, you can then play in any key you want. That does not mean that they will all sound the same. On the contrary, C major will be the most pure and F sharp major will be the wackiest. Um, but it is possible to devise as, as for instance, a Werkmeister did, as Kierenberger did, as later Valotti did. There are, I mean, there are all of these kinds of compromised temperaments. And uh, this is connected with the whole notion of the, the doctrine of affections, of emotions, the affect in lehre, in which individual keys are given or assigned individual temperaments, temperaments in the sense of character. It's obvious that if you use equal temperament, there is no possibility of that except as you have inherited it. The fact of the matter is that C major is majestic in historical terms. D major is celebratory. E flat is regal. F major is um, pastoral, for instance, B flat is cheerful, um, C minor is is pathetic, D minor is diabolical, E minor is mournful, F minor is um, uh, passionate, D minor is desperate. For Mozart, A minor was was the key of death, and and so on and so forth. So, I mean, obviously that Haydn wrote a symphony called La Passione, which is an F minor, and Beethoven wrote a sonata appassionata, which is an F minor, shows that these kinds of temperaments were universally understood. But to us, the idea that F minor is passionate is simply adduced by the fact that we inherit this notion, and because Beethoven thought it was passionate when he wrote it, it becomes that in, in that sense, but not in, in an acoustical way. You see, the whole doctrine of why a composer would write a false reprise when Beethoven writes... And in the middle of the piece we get... Now, if you have perfect pitch, you would say, oh, wait a minute, that's D major, and before it was an F major, that's the wrong key. But if you don't have perfect pitch, one of those keys is higher or lower than the other, but there is no way of particularly identifying them. You see, which is a problem. Whereas you didn't even have to have a good sense of relative pitch in those days. If you just heard the intervals, the size of this third and this third were different. And so D major and F major sounded different. And these days you can buy electronic keyboards, Roland and, and Yamaha and so on, where you're just at the press of a button, you can change the temperaments and you can actually hear how the fifths and the thirds change when you play major and minor triads. And it gives you a very clear sense of all of these things. So uh, certainly for composers in the 18th and well into the 19th century, there was an association between particular keys and particular temperaments. But I have to emphasize that this does not mean an absolute vibration number in hertz, because you went from one village to another and the, the tuning was different. To say nothing of the fact that there was choir tone and chamber tone, which meant that we even in one city or one village what they, what the, how the organ was tuned and how the instruments tuned to the organ on the one hand and how playing a piece of chamber music with harpsichord and violin were higher or lower. You see, all of that is immensely complicated. But the fact of the matter is that the character of the music derives from the size of intervals because of the fact that there is unequal temperament. And we have lost a great deal from dispensing with unequal temperament. And, I, and there is nothing, by the way, that would prevent 
us from having a, a keyboard tuner come in and take a Steinway and tune the Steinway unequally. It's perfectly manageable. It's something that you could do. And there might be something in, in, in favor of, of, of doing something like that. But very clearly, a composer like Bach heard D major and F major, G minor and A minor and C minor in very, very different ways. And it's important for us to recognize that because that's something that we've lost with the passage of time. But by the way, as to the theory about the squiggles on the first page of the Well-Tempered Clavier, uh, I find it very amusing. But I would have to say this, I would have to say this. If Bach had devised a system of tuning that he felt was one for all time, do you think that that's the only evidence that we would have that he had devised it? You don't think that Mütl, who studied with him, and Altnikol, who studied with him, and Kierenberger, who studied with him, and so on, that those people would not have written down the system of doing that and would have relied on a squiggle, which is only found in one particular manuscript of the Bach Well-Tempered Clavier? I think it's a little bit, just a little bit far-fetched somehow, uh, all of that. Besides which, if those people think that the Well-Tempered Clavier meant equal temperament, why was it that after Bach died, Kierenberger was still tinkering with unequal temperaments if, in fact, by that time Bach had given that up? I don't find that terribly persuasive. It's a strong, it's a, a strong uh, argument. Um, earlier, uh, philosopher Paul Bogosian passed on a, quest, uh, on a question through a, through a text message. Uh, he said that he would, he would like to ask you about Bach's modulation architecture and how it relates to his expressive goals, clarifying that uh, what he means is what does having such an architecture contribute to expression? Now, this is, uh, we're back to musical cognition and this is a deep we aesthetic. Are. We are, and also, uh, of course, you understand that, that the audacity of, of modulation is particularly interesting when you don't have equal temperament. It's not so interesting when you do, because all keys are then higher or lower than one another, but their sonorities aren't that terribly different. I mean, obviously, I mean, you, you have a, a composer like Mozart who is extremely conservative in his choice of keys, but writes modulations in very, very distant places. Whereas a composer like Haydn, for instance, likes to write pieces in C-sharp major and F-sharp major and B-flat minor, which is something that Mozart would never do, although he modulates to those keys. So there's a difference in aesthetics about, uh, about all of this, I would say. Uh, but... You know, the, the, the philosophy of uh, modulation, uh, as I say, has a lot to do with the continued existence of unequal temperament. And to understand, as I say, how the character, the temperament associated with individual keys um, really uh, affects listeners. Um, that's, that's why when I recorded the, the two books of the Well-Tempered Clavier, uh, because I believed that Bach was espousing a system of tuning that was usable on any and all keyboard instruments, that in book one I used four different keyboard instruments, one manual, two manual, harpsichord, clavichord, and organ, and in the second book I used all of those plus Silvermann piano, uh, because I wanted people to be able to hear these different keys all sounding really different. And as, as I say, not just higher and lower, but really quite drastically different. So that when you hear, um, it doesn't sound like, you see, I mean, there, there you could just say, okay, C major is higher than F sharp major, but other than that, there isn't any bit of difference except for just the, the issue of range. That's not so interesting. You know, I mean, I, I used to fool around with, with when I was in solfege class at the Paris Conservatory, and I would sit down and, and, and play a, a Bach fugue, you know, from the Well-Tempered Clavier, 
uh, in different keys, you know, so and, and ask them, can you guess which key is, is the one that Bach actually used? Well, there's no particular reason why anyone would be able to do that if they're used to hearing things in equal time. Otherwise, I'm going... Uh, to be the right key but I mean for most people they probably wouldn't necessarily notice it unless they have absolute pitch which by the way according to a, uh, a neurologist here in Boston is inherited uh, but I was just going to say I've been recently uh, reading about the Levitin effect where where he uh, uh, confirms with a study that uh, in fact quite a large, uh, almost surprisingly large number uh, of people in the general population that are not musicians uh, remember the either exact or relatively close to exact uh, pitch height to songs that they have heard. Well, but you see, that's the point. The point is, since it's inherited, you know, you don't know necessarily whether somebody is going to be growing up uh, playing music and therefore putting together their absolute pitch cognition on the one hand with playing a musical instrument or singing. And of course, also, as this person pointed out to me, he said, you know, his, his uh, wife has a perfect pitch and one of his daughters does and one of them doesn't and he doesn't, uh, that, that it can skip a generation. So you might have a, a father and a grandchild that, that have absolute pitch, but the person in the middle doesn't. Um, I remember reading an article in Die Zeit in Germany about somebody who had written a book saying that, in fact, there's no such thing as absolute pitch. Uh, it's just something that you can teach somebody. And uh, Nadia Boulanger, my teacher, used to say, you take a little child and take them to the piano, and every day... Just play all of the A's on the piano, and within a couple of months, they'll have, they'll have it, uh, the A in their ear for, for life, which is quite possible, actually. Or they might hate you, or, 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 or both. <laughs> but or they might not like A. <laughs> yeah, they might not like the. They might not like the A. Uh, speaking about just jumping a little bit earlier, so you said about, um, for example, uh, in rehearsal and uh, study, and that uh, you know interpretive details better uh, have some kind of explanation to them, and yet I'm sure. Uh, you, as I have, and many of us have encountered colleagues and students that will say, well, you know, so-and-so, it's just, it's just so analytical and I find it so constraining, but, you know, in fact, I just want to play and I want to be free, in which case uh, somebody as Mr. Radosh uh, devilishly looks and says, free from what? Uh, but, uh, but so... Um, uh, what, what are some of your strategies to uh, countering and coping with that? Because, uh, because also intellectual or analytical has uh, become a word that sometimes has, uh, let's say, negative connotations, especially when it comes to something as the art of music, where it's like, well, you know, just, just come out of thin air. Well, you know... Uh... Nadia Boulanger's piano was a, a picture of the philosopher and poet Paul Valéry, uh, which was inscribed to Nadia Boulanger, à celle qui dit l'enthousiasme et la rigueur, uh, to Nadia Boulanger who ordains enthusiasm and discipline. And it seems to me that uh, art, in all of its myriad manifestations, comes from a combination of freedom and discipline. Stravinsky once said, the more I constrain myself, the more I liberate myself. And uh, I, I don't think it behooves us to have an anti-intellectual uh, approach to playing music. I, I think we do uh, profit from having a sense of freedom in, in what we do. No question uh, uh, about that. But understanding the philosophy or the system by which a composer uh, achieves the power that she or he does uh, cannot be a bad thing. Uh, my, my feeling is that, that there's a risk that people who reject uh, uh, 
the intellectual side, who reject the rational side, who reject the, the constructive side of, of, of art, uh, may just not feel very comfortable uh, with that. Uh, naturally, you can say, well, it's my right to do anything that I want. Uh, but after all, if, if that's the way you feel, then maybe you should not necessarily be playing Beethoven, but writing your own music. Um, I, I don't mean to be intolerant of, uh, about this, but I, I said earlier in our dialogue here that it, it, it seems to me that there are going to be people who have an astonishing intuition. And those people are able to achieve the most spectacular kinds of, of uh, results uh, that are deeply poetic and dramatic and shattering and extraordinary without ever having taken a harmony course or a counterpoint course. And they are able to reach uh, quite astonishing uh, depths of expression without having subjected themselves to the rigor of a, of a disciplined uh, education. It's conceivable that that's the case. But for all of those people, there are more people, uh, you know, like me, who, who feel that it can't hurt to be educated. And that as long ago was said, knowledge is power. Uh, so that in, in, you know, investigating these things can produce revelations when we notice things in, in a piece by Schubert or in a piece by Beethoven uh, that suddenly transform our whole attitude towards performing um, in a positive direction because we suddenly see how things cohere uh, you know, a, a composer uh, like, like Schubert, who had such an, an uncanny understanding of harmony and who does things which, which just cause one's, one's brain uh, to be completely amazed. Um, if, if we understand how they, they do that, uh, that makes it possible for us to speak and to uh, communicate our language with a sense, I think, of, of conviction that is likely to be rather convincing to people. You know, I mean, look at what Mozart says when he talks about his three piano concertos, K4, 13, 414, and 415, when he says they're a happy medium between something which is uh, too complicated and too, too simple. Um, and he then says, um, there are certain passages which only connoisseurs will understand, but the rest of the audience will not help but be pleased, albeit without knowing why. And to me, that's a message for the ages. So, you know, you're playing on the stage for someone who has a deep knowledge of the music. And that person, understanding all of these things, will hear what you do and say, this person understands. This person is a member of the Cognoscenti. And somebody who's sitting up in the upper balcony doesn't understand all of that, but he says, I don't know what's going on here, but I've never heard this piece sound like this. This is really interesting. When is this person playing again? I want to go and hear her. I want to hear him again. You know, what can be possibly wrong with doing that? I think it's, it's important to try to understand as, as deeply as we can uh, what the message of the composer is, what, what the composer is, is trying uh, to achieve. You know, I mean, there is on the one hand a kind of, of instinct with which all of us are born. And we don't know much about it, but that's just the way we are. It's what makes us attracted to certain people or not other people. It's, it's what, what uh, makes us gravitate towards certain things which taste better or not, not quite so much. I mean, instinct is just something there. We have no, no real control over it, but we're born with it. And then you have knowledge. You have everything that accrues to you through your, your long, hopefully your long trajectory of life. And through experience, I mean, you learn not to put your, your finger on the stove because you'll burn yourself. Uh, you learn all sorts of things. And what happens is something miraculous. The combination of knowledge and, on the other hand, instinct melds together into what we call intuition. 
And intuition is neither purely instinctual, nor is it a priori entirely knowledge-based. But it is something that enables us to begin to look at certain things and imagine certain things and uh, push in certain directions because um, the two things mutually support one another. They power each other and they give us a sense of confidence that the path upon which we are embarking may indeed uh, be a fruitful one. That's beautifully spoken, uh, Robert. To my mind, uh, also related to what you said, came a phrase, uh, I think, from an old English uh, treatise on music that I know Mr. Buzoni was fond of quoting, that uh, the phrase being that uh, music is a science, but its goal is pleasure. And I think that combines combines both the the theoretical and analytical aspects that we've spoken about and obviously the immense and practically inexplicable pleasure that um, that music uh, brings into all of our lives be it um, professionals amateurs uh, listeners or anybody and in fact as we know essentially no human society that doesn't have some kind of music uh, Absolutely, on and the power, the power of, of, of music, which is perhaps unique in the arts, to cause people to weep or to fill them with exaltation or uh, just uh, uh, an extraordinary exuberance uh, is something that will continue, I think, to amaze all of us. And I, I can't think of a better way to end this uh, conversation than to have... Uh, uh, really uh, addressed uh, that which which you have uh, reminded uh, us so eloquently. Thank you, Kirill. Well, thank you, Robert, and you've really taken us on a um, on a cosmic journey through uh, not only Bach's uh, harmonic universe and his view of the universe, but also so many topics that were we were able to touch, but also so many topics that we were able to touch thanks to so many wonderful questions from uh, from an illustrious list of participants and, and I thank I thank them all in humility and in joy. Yes, and I must say the humility that I feel um, in organizing this series and encountering so much brilliant thought and information from um, from from all the wonderful guests of course, from you, Robert. It's wonderful to have you twice this year, and we've already spoken. I think we have a bit of a sketch of what your uh, next visit may be and what topic. That will stay a, um, a secret for now. I want to thank everybody, wishing everybody a happy holiday season, whatever you celebrate. Uh, stay healthy, and we shall be back. We'll start quite early in January, and I look forward to all of you joining, participating, learning together and uh, exchanging ideas. So thank you, Robert. Happy New Year to everyone. And um, thank you all. Thank you for being part of this wonderful uh, uh, experience that we have all shared with one another. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye.